So here I am, just about to embark on my first gameplay in 80 days. London, 1872. I have entered into the service of a gentleman. It would seem... that he is a gambling man. London, my old friend, how happy I am to return to you. So I have to say, so far, like, I'm super excited. That opener just now kind of felt like I was embarking into a movie. And, uh, I mean, the exciting part of this virtual travel that I'm embarking on right now with 80 days is it's going to take me through time, through history, as well as uh, around the world. So as I said, hello London, my old friend. Monsieur Phileas Fogg returned home early from the Reform Club and in a new fangled steam carriage besides. I helped him down and the iron lung steamed driven horses clattered away. Pasparo, said he, we are going around the world. Around the world, monsieur. Very good, monsieur, I murmured dutifully, not believing a word of it. We shall circumnavigate the globe within 80 days. He was quite calm as he proposed this wild scheme. We leave for Paris at eight tw uh, on the 825 in an hour. But of course, or this was quite the departure for my master who was, by all accounts, a creature of inflexible habit, habit and mechanical regularity. Perhaps the carriage's engine fumes had affected his reason. For Paris, monsieur? To begin with, yes. Pack uh, an altometer and my evening jacket. There is not a moment to waste. You, Pasparout, now have the funds. Your character is now dependable. So, just stopping right here. This is interesting. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't realize that um, part of what I was going to get into here was kind of a bit of a choose your own adventure. So I'm kind of liking this. Um, I, I'm going to be interested to kind of replay this again later and, uh, you know, push different buttons and different responses from my, my character, uh, Pasparo. Um, at uh at a later date um or later game playthrough anyhow exciting just make a note of that in my little game log ah there you are paris i only saw you briefly last time i was here okay quickly passport collect our things and we will be off. Okay, so how does one pack for 
80 days around the world. I'm not quite sure, but let's have a look here. Uh, pocket altometer. Air sickness is psychological. An altometer can be most reassuring. Okay, I'm not actually sure what an altometer is. Uh, an evening jacket, a well-fitted, neatly tailored Seville row evening jacket, priceless, um, part of an Englishman's wardrobe set. Okay, definitely we need an evening jacket. It looks like we already have wool trousers and wool shirts packed. I'm thinking we're also going to need some lighter clothing as well because wool is going to get uh, a little bit heavy, but an evening jacket's a must. Oh. Looks like I'll drag that down there. Okay, playing cards, a deck of 52 playing cards, suitable for a whist drive or two. Of interest to humorous stalwarts, officials, sold in soldier types. Now this might actually be very useful. Um, I'm going to hold off on that for a second. Uh, slender volume listing all the shipping routes within Europe. That is a must. Oh, hang on a sec. It says, okay, so that's a must. We definitely need to pack that. Uh, a wax cylinder inscribed with the marks describing, with marks describing a recording of a sym symphony. Huh. Uh, I'm not sure if we need that. Um, we definitely need playing cards, I think. Okay. Well, if we've got the room, why not? Are we losing points for this? Are we using up any? Okay. Okay, it seems that we can't fit any more in the suitcase. Try one more time just to play it safe. It's a very small suitcase, but that's all it holds. Those are two things that should have been able to get in there. However, that said, I think um, I think we picked the, the most useful items there. Okay, now, what's this? I can take a picture? Oh, hey! That's kind of cool. I'll be able to take pictures on my journey. Woohoo, cheers to that. Okay, now I'm not sure what I do here. What if I close that? Oh, there we are. New routes discovered. Our completed Englishman's wardrobe should help us negotiate times of upper class journeys. Huh. Okay, so we're still in London and it's time to depart. And I wonder what happens, just out of curiosity, if I pre click on pack again. Okay, and nothing else will go in there, I don't think. Let's just double check, no. Okay. The game of a whist later, I think. Okay. Ooh, we're gonna head on the Amphitheater Express. Now, it says bags times one. Oh, I guess I don't get to take a bag with me. Or maybe my uh, Philip Miss Monsieur Fogg has his own bag that he is taking with him. Okay. Departing now. The guard's van has space for one suitcase, which will suffice. Travel. This looks like a bearable option. Go. quite the uh, horse-drawn carriage that we've got going on there. In 
mechanical horse race past Piccadilly Circus and Pall Mall faster than a team of thoroughbreds. Even so, the whistle of the 825 was blowing as we pulled up to the Charing Cross station. I think in this case, I'm gonna gamble and just go and throw myself on board the train. We raced along the concourse and threw ourselves aboard, aboard as the second whistle shrieked its warning. We barely had time to take our seats before the guard rapped smartly on the compartment door. He held out a, uh, a hand. Tickets, please. Okay. I'm going to throw myself on the mercy of the guard. With a loss, machine. We were in a great hurry, I explained, giving him a beseeching look. We did not want uh, have time to buy tickets. You may purchase them from me, the guard was saying, though it is more expensive, I'm afraid. Eighty-five pounds, please. Okay, I'm going to try arguing with him. I argued with him, or rather I began to, but Mr. Fogg, Monsieur Fogg, interrupted, Pasparo. You will pay the sum at once, he put in coldly, and remunerate this man for his patience. Ooh. I'm just going to hand over the 85 pounds. I handed over the 85 pounds and smiled a thin smile. From one working man to another, the guard gave me our tickets and slid the compartment door shut behind him with a pneumatic uh, hiss. Your funds have gone down somewhat. Okay, I'm on far form, but we must make haste. Hmm. Looks like we can converse with somebody. I'm at your service, Monsieur Fogg. Casparo? So, we're going to begin a conversation, I believe, on the journey right now. But tell me, Michelle, what is the purpose of our journey? I have made a hefty wager, and I do not intend to lose, said Mr. Michelle Fogg. Okay, now I am curious about money, so let's chat about that. This journey will be most expensive, Michelle. Indeed, but we can earn a little from buying and selling our possessions as we travel. Okay, that sounds good. Very good, Michelle. The London smog gave way to rolling hills and the pastures of the Kentish countryside, still untouched by the hand of Technologic, technological advancement. Okay, I think I'd probably repack my bag. So, Monsieur Fogg um, read the pa his paper whilst I repacked our bags, thrown together together in haste and confusion, as afternoon turned in a absorbably to evening, I discovered that my master was one of those gentlemen who broke their silence rarely, if at all, a guard rapped on our door. A few miles before Dover. We are about to submerge, he warned. Take some people a bit of a bit funny, so watch out. Okay. Uh, I definitely want to know what we mean by submerging. What do you mean submerge, I cried. This is the London to Paris Am Amphitrite Express, he explained, as though to a particularly dim-witted child. The submersible train. Talk of all the London papers?
Then this is a mer train, I exclaimed. He made a face. Bloody journalists and their silly names, he muttered. Every inch of her has been examined and stamped with the artificer's seal. This is the world's only bodyscape locomotive. I pressed my face to the window glass. As the fins above the amphitrite's wheels extended with a hydraulic hiss, night fell and we plunged past the end of the track into the freezing waters of the English Channel. Oh, this is very cool and shall I say somewhat unexpected now what else? the amphitrite plowed through the water overnight and splashed up onto the wider ga gauge French tracks at Calais as dawn broke do you have a route in mind Bashir? I began to consider That's a good question. Do you have a route in mind, monsieur? I asked as the water of the channel dried from the compartment windows. I am as of yet undecided, my master admitted. The new canal has sped up the shipping route uh, from Suez to Bombay, though perhaps we could take the Trans-Siberian Railway across Russia. Ooh. I really kind of want to go across Russia. I've never been across Russia. So in that case, surely not Bombay, I exclaimed. We shall certainly wilt in that scorching heat. Yes, you shall, because you only packed wool pants and <laughs> wool shirts. Then we would do well to buy hats and linen trousers, he replied. There are other alternatives. We may also travel overland and across the Black and Caspian Seas. Okay. I'm going to ask which is faster. But which is faster? I believe, said he, that that is what we shall put to the test. Parbleu, I scarcely knew what to think. We arrived at Paris Gare de Nord just after one o'clock. That is a train station that I was in not so long ago, a year ago to this date actually. Well, not quite the just over a year ago. But I imagine in eighteen seventy two it might have been a different looking place. Automaton porters lifted our luggage and then our persons onto the platform with long, delicately filigreed arm, iron arms. I can tell you that over a year ago, that was not what was happening at Paris Gal de Nord. Paris, Paris, city of my heart. It was home, but not to stay. if that's our little train. Cool. I can send postcards. evening jacket could earn us well here. Yes, it could. Okay. 
Now we have options. We can go to the market, we can go to the bank, uh, or we can go and explore. Now I can tell you right now, uh, I definitely want to go and explore. Um, although there's going to be so many cities that I want to explore. And the question is, do we waste our time here in Paris that we've already been to, or do we explore in other cities? Oh look, that's zooming out. Okay, I'm going to zoom back in because we want to be back and see Paris. Oh, I think I have to click on it. There we are. Okay, so I always like going to the market in any place that I am, so I think we're going to start with the market. Okay, tucked away in the seventh arrondissement is my favorite market street. And we have choices here. There's a shaving kit, a geometry. Okay, so a shaving kit, hair soaps, Brussels. That might be a good thing for us keeping, you know, looking decent as we go. Um, a geometric drawing instrument precisely made and beautifully presented. Okay, we might have use for that too, because we're travel cloak. Good for keeping chill winds and heavy rains out. That's a good one too. And a magnificent bottle. Well, I like the wine. However, I have to say, possibly the things that are going to be of the most value. A shaving kit, yes. Mm. Well, I think we might need an extra suitcase because I don't think this is going to fit in here. No, it's not. Okay. So we're going to need an extra suitcase. Shaving kit. Drawing instrument. I think this might be useful. And a travel cloak will definitely be useful. Oh, we'll move that right there. Oh, look. If we move things around, we can fit more in our pack. That's good to know. So, I wonder if I pull my... That's very good to know. Okay. Now, for now, can't believe a map shipping timetables takes up so much space. Okay. We're going to leave it there. Even though I love the wine, we're not going to take the wine. Um, and we might, you know, do more buying in cities that aren't quite so expensive as Paris. Oh, we got there right before it closed. That's good to know. The bank is now closed. Um, do we have to head to a hotel or can we continue to travel? Since we've already seen Paris before. Well, this is cool. We can see where we've been so far. Press share. This will open your personal journeys page in your browser. You can share this link and it will be kept updated as you travel. Cool. It's very cool. Okay, we need to go back to the game now. we go. Now what happens if we click here? Okay. I guess we're going to have to spend the night since there doesn't seem to be a train going.
Yes, we will pass the night here. We took a hotel for the night. We will be comfortable here, Monsieur, F Monsieur Fogg remarked. But traveling overnight will often be more efficient. I did look for a train, Monsieur Fogg. So we must board the longest journeys. Ah, where possible, because I did look. We cannot travel where it is not pa possible, certainly, he replied. Still, the surroundings of the Hotel Ritz were most enjoyable. And given that that was just thrown on me, it was not a bad place to spend a nice relaxing night before things got perhaps less relaxing along the way. The clock is ticking past Par Perot. We must decide our next steps quickly. Okay. Well, it looks like we're not actually offered many next steps. There's no travel here. So, I guess we're going to go and explore. We had a few hours to spare. I asked Monsieur Fogg if I might enjoy my city before we had to leave. Indeed, and should you learn anything of note, be sure to relay it. I nodded and headed into town. The talk on the street was of one thing only, an enormous, elegant oval stadium constructed upon the green fields of Champ de Mars and containing the technological marvels, art, amusement parks, and milling crowds of the World Fair of 1872. I ventured inside. The grand illuminated pavilions of the exposition, an artifice was I went west towards the airship hangar. This might prove to be useful. Passed a booth with a husband and wife pair selling panoramic hot air balloons, uh, balloon rides to eager tourists. I inquired as to their hourly rate. Uh, the hangar was crowded with airships. Okay, I'm going to go... The hangar was crowded with airships and flying vehicles of all shapes and sizes, attended by sharp-eyed crews from all over the world, and my eyes were immediately caught by... Okay, I have very much got a soft spot for Egypt. So I'm going to be drawn towards the gilded Egyptian Ifrit class airship. Painted all over with stylish poppies and feathers, it resembled nothing more than a vast flying sarcophagus. Ooh, that's somewhat uh, sinister. Do people really fly in such things? I asked the exhibitor. Indeed, hundreds of them do every day, he replied with a booming laugh. They say the skies of Arabia are crisscrossed with the trails of the Egyptian ships. Perhaps one day soon, Miss Monsieur Fogg and I would find ourselves flying in such a craft. I returned to the exposition center, my thoughts turning uh, with clouds and engine rotors. Avenues sprawled in every direction between the inviting illuminated pavilions of the exposition. Okay, let's go look at the artifice. An artifice was replacing an arc light which had burned out. She first uh, disconnected a strange machine powering the lights. It had a spinning iron wheel, which was wound around a series of 
armature coils. What is that device, Artificer? I ask politely, my eyes straying to the copper lily pen which proclaimed her profession. It's a bleeding nuisance is what it is, said the Artificer, grumbling in a thick Yorkshire accent. These gram machines are finicky beasts. Gram machines? I inquired. Well, it's a... Oh, never mind. She waved away my question. It's a steam engine, all right. Only it doesn't make steam. Will that do? I hate explaining this stuff to a layman. So her tone was belied by her gentle touch. As she unscrewed the arc light's globe, of enameled glass and replaced the two carbon rods within. She reconnected the supply and the ten uh, ya block vos candles connected in a series lit up um, in series lit up once more. They are miraculous, I breathe. The artificer snorted. Their hard work is what they are. Miracles indeed. But her mouth softened into a small, proud smile. She looked at her watch, cursed, and hurried off, dropping something as she went. I hurried after her to return it. And she thanked me. My medallion! I'll need that uh, to get my lunch uh, from the canteen. Thank you. I bowed in return, and she giggled. Stop that. You'll make me blush. She rubbed the coin thoughtfully. I was given this for my work in Istanbul, you know. I made a very small uh, automaton. I think it works as a driver now. Uh, on the r route up from Izmir. I, I think that's right. An automaton who can drive? Of course. Is that so strange? I can only shrug. Who knows what is normal in this modern world? I looked about me once more. Crowds of tourists jostled and heaved past, their eyes wide with wonder. I headed towards the red and purple tents of the Artificers Guild, draped with banners and blazoned with their copper lily uh, sea seagull. A steam-powered automaton uh, orchestra played gleaming brass instruments. It had the most incredible display of machines, as though a scrapyard had been brought to playful life. One of the artificers had his hands deep inside a human-shaped automaton, rummaging through the clockwork innards. He took out a piece of engraved glass and peered at it with a jeweler's loop. Dash it, thing, he cursed in his upper-class crust, upper class English tones, and then looked up. Oh, hello! I pointed at the shard. What is that? It's the control glass of my automaton. Or it would be if it worked. This one is meant to be a cook, but can't even fry a, trip, uh, a chip. How does the glass work? He looked pained for a moment. It's complicated, he replied. Light scatters and bends, and never mind. In this case, it doesn't work. I need a Persian engraver. The, the best work is done in Tehran, you know. I stared at the inanimate automaton. I had seen them before, of course, but never so still, and never close up. They were perfect, and yet, on the outside at least, so simple, so smooth, their faces without detail or distinction. You look a little scared, the artificer remarked.
It looks so human. Not really, he shouted. They're human shaped, but it's hardly in disguise. The artificial sm smiled. I wished him well on his culinary endeavors. He was, at least, in the right city to find a cook and returned to the center of the explosion, ears ringing with bombastic uh, tunes of the steam orchestra. My feet were tiring, and the hour was growing late. I returned to Monsieur Fogg, who was eating a meal of plain boiled beef a uh, anglaise. Um, did you enjoy the exposition, my master inquired uh, divinantly? Having preferred a hearty meal and an English newspaper to all the wonders that the modern world had to offer. Do you think we'll encounter artificers on our travels, I asked with enthusiasm? Assuredly. I intend for us to use the most efficient transport available. I dreamed that night of the mechanical wonders and automatons with beautifully enameled faces, knowing little of the strange inventions and stranger people I would soon encounter in my journey around the world. Okay. Hurry, Pasporo. Don't drop those cases. I feel it's time to depart. Um, Patty. For fear that we will take too long, and this is an expensive city. Okay, now we have. Is there only the option of embarking in a private car? Is there no other option? Oh, these are other people on journeys around the world. They're racing us. Okay. Now, back to Perry. We need to depart, but I'm hoping we have other options than besides an private car to Amsterdam. Uh, oh, there are other options. The Pyrenees Express departs for Nice in two days. At, oh, it's not for two days from now. I suspect this could be altered. Negotiate. Okay, so that's an option. Negotiating. Munich departs tomorrow at 6 p.m. Again, we could potentially negotiate Vienna, the Orient Express to Vienna, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Again, we could negotiate. Okay, let's see. Okay, so if we embark by car, that's going to be uh, to Amsterdam. Looks like that's a 75-pound journey. Now, if we go by the Pyrenees to to Nice, which is a much further way, mind you, it depends on which way we're going, uh, that is $55, 170 to Munich, or that's too expensive, we're ignoring Munich. Now Vienna, on the Orient Express, um, it's 250 Whew. Uh, okay, we're going to go Amsterdam way. So we can leave now, and it's a bit more... The car has space for one more suitcase, but we have two. Oh, we need a second car for two suitcases? That's a bit ridiculous. not getting rid of luggage only early on in our trip. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, let's look at our other options. Um, well, that's an inexpensive option, but it doesn't leave for two days. Let's negotiate here. Englishman's wardrobe should yield results. Okay, we'll put on the Englishman's wardrobe. Almost generous. No charge. Tomorrow. The ticket will require... Further 55 pounds. Look at Nice, another expensive city. Mm. Okay, so that's one option. Now what about if we were to look at our other options here? So 170. Let's try negotiating. Englishman's wardrobe, that was definitely no charge at 6 p.m. Okay, so that would be 6 p.m. today. Take us to Munich. How much did we spend on the hotel yesterday? I don't remember. I should pay more attention to these things. Okay. Uh, oh, and that's tomorrow at 6 p.m. Departs. Oh, no. So departs today at 6 p.m. Okay, now let's just take one more look. Vienna, tomorrow at 6 p.m. See what happens. Okay, we can leave for Vienna at 6 p.m. Two fifty. Pass by Munich, go straight to Vienna. Okay, no charge, and we we'll leave at 6 p.m. today. That would take us the furthest we could get, and probably, even though it's the most expensive, it also would probably be the cheapest in the long run. So we're gonna do that. Okay, here we go, Orient Express. I've always wanted to be on the Orient Express. Okay, the overhead rack has space for one suitcase. We have two. Okay. We're going to hire space. Damn, that seems expensive. Oh well, that's what we're doing. Go. Gotta take a picture from on the Orient Express. Boarding the Orient Express was altogether a calmer affair than our race through London had been. Mechanical porters loaded us in through the windows, then <laughs> Got loaded in through the windows and snapped them shut with a delicate click. Ah, oh, the train was very beautiful. A jewel of both European design and European diplomacy. With the Compagnie International de Wagons uh, Leeds having persuaded several envious empires to be linked together by the train line. It was uniquely placed to sweep us across Europe, or at least as um, the Duschkeser where the track currently ceased. Um, a long whistle blast blew and we began our journey east. Oh, wait, there's news. Paris World Fair, a roaring success. Oh, I guess my opportunity to talk to Monsieur Fogg has disappeared Why I read the newspaper. My master wished to be undisturbed, so we left Paris. So as we left Paris, I left him and went to explore the train. There was a delightful dining car and an observation deck formed by the replacement of an entire compartment with an open glass cube. 
I stopped there watching the scenery flash past. I attended the dining car. Okay, the dining car is bound to be expensive. Although, and the observation car would be pretty darn cool. So I'm going to stop and watch the scenery. And as I stood, a portly gentleman with a quivering, luxuriant mustache struggled by carrying several trunks. I offered to help um, him. I offered him my aid, and he introduced himself after a shower of thanks. Henri de Blowitz, for correspondent of the Times. Are you working, Michelle? I asked, and to my delight, he assured me he was. I am, he patted his breast pocket. The stories that you hear, it seems everywhere is on the brink of one revolution or another. Everywhere there is progress, but who will count the cost? That sounds most ominous, ominous, I told him. Does it, he replied with a beaming smile. Well, I'm a journalist. It's my duty to make omens. Good day to you. With that, he clapped me on the shoulder and he headed off in the direction of the dining car. I followed him and found a few groups of people talking quietly. Oh, I'm going to spend a bit more time with Mr. Deblowitz. I sat with Mr. Deblowitz, and we passed an awkward few hours as we drank, as he drank his way through cup after cup of coffee and talked of nothing but his tailor. <laughs> I would definitely be eavesdropping shamelessly. I eavesdropped shamelessly on the other passengers, overhearing a conversation between a young composer and two Parisian ladies, who, it transpired, were headed uh, to the same concert in Vienna. I continued to listen, curious of the details about that city. My papa says it's very dangerous, remarked one girl, whose name I learned was Isabel uh, Poitier. He says the emperor is spoiling for war. I interjected, do you think it will come soon? Why indeed, Isabel replied. I have heard they are already moving their soldiers in vast numbers. And what soldiers, her companion remarked, though I do not think she was swooning at the romance of it. Instead, there seemed to be fear in her eyes. I continued the conversation for a while, but it quickly turned to a matter of hats. And Though I'm a ballet, but there are some aspects of my tasks um, that I find tr truly tedious. So I left them to their talk, bid de Bullwitz uh, a good night, and returned to Monsieur Fogg, who, to my surprise, looked up from his paper at me. What did you learn? he inquired. I told him of the rumblings of war from Vienna, but he seemed indifferent. I don't think war will break out by the day after tomorrow, he observed. So I think we will be safe. I had nothing more to say. It's probably a good time for a snooze. Oh yeah, full night's sleep from the looks of the time there. This is good, though. We're saving on uh, having to get a hotel for the evening.
We arrived at Vienna in the early hours of the morning, I'll say 4 a.m. The custom officials insisted on searching our bags for, of all things, artificing the tools. I asked De Blowitz, who was lingering on the platform for an exclamation. Ah, the intradictions, of course. He saw my look of bafflement and continued, only imperial artificers may produce automata in Austro-Hungary. A strange state of affairs, which troubled me. Invention should not be trampled by, auto, by autocratic whim. It was therefore with some apprehension that I created Vienna, city of music. Wonder if we'll see the lip is on stallions. Has been a while. Oh, and enjoy. We will have to explore Vienna to find the onward journey. I will not say no to that because Vienna is a city of yummy chocolates and desserts. I did not see a single flesh and blood soldier in Vienna, the city of music. My dear friend, friends, the rumors are quite real. The Austro-Hungarian empire's might, might is built upon its armies of mechanical men. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Well, I'm going to go with it's a magnificent sight. They are a magnificent sight, ranged in gleaming rows along the wide Parisian-style boulevards. Their enamel uniforms shine to a polish. As I watched, I was approached by a bookish fellow who hurried out uh, from under the impressive eagle art portcullis of the Veghaus, Vig the imperial armory. You think them fantastical, he demanded curious turn to his voice. I think they're somewhat terrifying. Terrifying, I replied. Automata built for war? It is worse than you could imagine, he replied. He stuck out his hand. Herr Dalzer, apprentice engineer in the Imperial Gregor Gregorskistra. We went to a cafe to talk. And once he started, he would not stop. Have you noticed none of the mechanical soldiers carry weapons, he hissed. What did you make of that? It is most unusual, I agreed. Inside each one is a Mossad head device, perfectly tuned, Eridanza replied. The song the soldiers the soldiers sing is one of devastation. A battalion in harmony can punch through a steel wall. He drew a gilded flute from his scarab and laid it on the table, looking at it thoughtfully. The automata understand music, I asked. No, no, he answered, uninterested in my line of thinking. They merely respond to musical pitch and tone. I cannot re reproduce his entire explanation, for it is it rather stretched my German, but it seemed the mechanical armies of the Austria, austro hungaria are controlled by music. Will you be staying in the city tonight? he asked. Why do you ask? I inquired. He glanced about him before replying. The army is preparing itself. Events are on the move here. If you stay, you would see for yourself. Is it worth seeing? I persisted. You are traveling, he replied. The army is traveling into Belgrade. 
And what of you? Will you ever leave Vienna? I dream of it, he confessed. As a boy, I longed to join the Artificers Guild, but for someone born in this country, it is impossible. The Kaisers and the Guild are sworn enemies. The Guild, I reminded him, were politically neutral. He shook his head. The Guild are forbidden within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Our automata are not Guild approved. They are our own. His mouth was a cold line. The Guild would not contents, um, contents building such monsters. Thanking him for the coffee, I strolled back along the avenues, watching the city pass by with new eyes. Um, under its gilded and manicured be beauty lurked something sharper and more bloodthirsty. Vienna was at once the, sp was at once the city of music and the city of war. Oh, okay. Even though I'd love some chocolates in Vienna, we don't really have the room in our suitcases with how much extra we're being charged. And it's 9.30 a.m. We don't want a hotel. We want to depart. Warsaw or Budapest? Parts before 7 p.m. Parts in two days. Okay, let's go to Budapest. Uh, private car. Gallant train. Negotiate. Let's just see if there's any other options. Venice, we don't want to go to Venice. Can take two suitcases, that's good. Um, could leave at noon. It's already 12.30, so if you're leaving, I guess they don't want to negotiate with us. This is a problem. I missed out on the noon. Okay. I'm going to Budapest. Quickly now, before we miss. Um, okay. Going to Budapest. Okay, well, we're going to go anyhow. We hired an oil guzzling Bozek to take us along the open road from Vienna to Budapest. The road followed um, the rail tracks for much of the way, but we saw no trains as we shuffed along. Okay, we're gonna talk. Greetings, driver. Yes, hello. The Artificers Guild has... Oh, I need to know about Budapest. The Artificers Guild has no presence in Budapest. OK. 
Okay. Um, why don't we start with this? Is it possible to go to uh, from Budapest to Belgrade? Sounds unlikely. Okay. Uh, we don't want to go to Venice because we've just come from there. So Dubrovnik. Enough talking. Okay. He was not so friendly. We arrived in the evening without incident. That's good. The geometry equi equipment could earn us well. Okay. Well, wow, that's good to know. Um, I wonder how that would earn us well. Do we go to the market? Oh, we will have to sleep here before exploring the city. And it is 619. Okay, so... Um, let's go look at the market just in case we can trade. Looks like we can get stuff here, but not necessarily trade anything. Okay, so we're going to leave this. We'll go. We're going to get our hotel. A dusty jacketed Englishman at our hotel recommended a restaurant called Clemens. To Monsieur Fogg. The Magyars um, make an excellent broth, he promised. Ominous words indeed. I had never really been one for um, broth. A broth is, in my humble opinion, merely an incomplete consomme. At best, an inferior bouillon. Monsieur Fogg was set on the matter, however. Okay, I concealed my trepidation with professionalism. We settled to dinner at Clemens, where our soup arrived in a gleaming silver terrine. My master, a man of impeccably high standards, even remarked upon the terrine's flawless polish, at which point it exploded. Splattering myself, Mr. Fogg, and an extremely bewildered waiter in admittedly delicious salmon broth. Oh, that's going to smell while you're traveling. Um, a fellow diner had been struck by the edge of the terrine's lid and was bleeding from his temple. I rushed to his aid, pressing a napkin to his head, while my master looked on unperturbed. The head chef had, by this time, emerged from the kitchen. He pointed towards the wall and began a voluble rant, which needed a little translation. The bloth had splattered uh, the ivory wall in intricately curved, sh in the intricately curved shape of a lily, unmistakably the symbol of the artificer's guild. I examined. I examined the room to, re to read. Right at the bottom was a tiny automaton, the size and shape of a scarab beetle. It was rather clogged with, the, with soup and a bit dented, but its metal legs were kicking. Clearly, it was responsible for the symbolic exploding soup. This is a tough question. If I pocket it, will it blow up again? Showed it to the waiter, whose face immediately darkened. The artificer's guild, he muttered. Kurzaza, they have gone too far this time. I looked around at the chaos caused by a single bowl of exploding soup. The guild is a collection of repairmen and designers, I said. 
We do not go about blowing up perfectly salted bowls of soup. Our waiter sighed. They were banned by the emperor, so we could make our own imperial automata outside of their control. The guild is growing more vocal in its objections. Personally, I thought that, okay, the guild was growing heavy handed. It was one thing to have a political dispute with the state about the production of automata. And it was quite another to start ruining dinners. Huh. Okay, we're still hungry, so let's stay for the main course. But did not enjoy it. The incident had rather shaken our confidence, and I could see even my master was concerned. How many exploding broths could our precarious journey survive? The funds have gone down a little. Okay, I'm going to explore, because... I hear that I could pers possibly make a sale here that might help us. Although... It took a few hours to explore, investigating the various options for how we might continue our journey. plan. Looks like we're going south. Okay. 96 to get to there. Parts tomorrow. What if I go to Arrives Tuesday? I made a very special automaton. I think it would work as a driver now on the route to Ismar, the World's Fair. Ah, yes. Okay, how do we do that? It appear you cannot go this way today. Okay, how about if we... Departs tomorrow. Take this journey, we'll have to spend the night. Both will have to spend the night. Okay. Or at 8 a.m. This one's got to be 8 a.m. tomorrow as well. Okay, the earliest departure is not until tomorrow. Okay. There is no chance of traveling this way today. Okay. Is there any other options? Okay. Well, we're going tomorrow, then. Well, I guess we're going back to Budapest here. Oh. Is there any chance that we can do anything with this right now? Ooh! Yes, let's do that. That's a good deal compared to what we got for it. Okay, uh, we're heading into the south. Compass would be good. Okay, we're taking a compass with us. with us. Well, absence of vodka would be nice. 
We need the money. Okay. Okay. These people actually sell something. Okay. We have to get another night in the hotel. With what remained of the day, I afforded my master every service. I sp spent a while, I'm gonna spend a while to talking to the hotelier to learn what I could learn, I could. Learning that you could pick up busts of Apollo in Athens that will sell for a fortune in Hail. Most interesting snippet. Okay, that is an interesting snippet. So I think we depart today. And we're gonna depart for Athens. Okay, we'll embark. Today we turned south. The Orient Express Company ran a spur line from Budapest that swept down the length of Europe to Athens. It originally stopped midway at Belgrade. But since that city's almost total destruction in the last confrontation between the Austro-Hungarians and the Ottoman, the tra train now went straight through. Such destruction, it had, it w was to be hoped, taught the powers that be a lesson about tolerance. Okay, I've never done this fog thing, so we're gonna try this. Ah, a close shave, superb. May as well keep our master happy. Despite knowing to expect it, I could not help but gasp as we swept through the empty husk of Belgrade. It seemed home only to ghosts. It was like a perfectly preserved museum exhibit. To all appearance, one might believe there had been, never been people here at all. Quite what had happened no one truly knows knew the roads houses viaducts were all still standing the gas lamps still burned but not a single voice cried out and not a door or shutter moved i asked mr fogg his mr fogg his thoughts and he sighed i fear that our age is seeing a great experimentation in warfare, much as in every other walk of life. I hope you're wrong. Yes, I am not, he replied, but at least the train, the trains move faster. His answer seemed to me as bleak as Belgrade itself, but as the Orient Express left it behind, it carried us towards a long evening of gentle wines and candle lights, which went some way towards lightening the soul. <sighs> Guild spokesman confirms bomb in soup not aimed at fog. Uh, 
sleeping on the train again. I also thought to save us some money on hotel fare. Hmm. We arrived at Telovsky Station in northern Greece in the morning. A few passengers disembarked. Don't want us to miss our train. Uh, let's join them for a short bit. And we joined them. Mr. Fogg thinking perhaps a route eastward from here would be efficient. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. explore. The people of this city are crazy. They go out in the evenings and tear down what remains of the city wall. I have never seen such a thing. Granted, it's not as though the walls uh, keep anything out. They encircle barely half the city and are scalable due to the quantity of rubble piled up uh, this side and that. I stopped a young woman and asked what they were doing, but she only laughed in my face. You may not know our city now, she replied. Not in the least uh, bit answering my question, but we will encompass the entire uh, the entirety of northern Greece. I remarked that it seemed unlikely, but she did not stay to listen to my point. Preferring to raise the sledgehammer, she brought it down, uh, brought along for the occasion. She set about the ancient wall once more, and... I scurried away lest I lose my hat from a piece of flying stone. I wonder if I can get back on the train. Okay, well, I think for now I'm going to go Oh, wow, well, it's been a good first seven days. I'm feeling exhausted after that So I'm going to uh, click off for now um, I uh, this is a very different story than I was expecting. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm finding it more to be a story than I am to being a game, although there is that thing about choosing things and my disappointment when I accidentally got off the train thinking that maybe I could just stretch my legs at the side of the platform and then get back on. Uh, so I didn't end up in Athens. Um, so I guess those are the gaming elements in there. Is, is those choices that you make. Um, anyhow, really interesting. Um, 
And I'm kind of feeling like it's the kind of game that I might enjoy creating myself because uh, it's kind of that choose your own adventure story that I grew up loving. Uh, I was sort of expecting that, you know, maybe I'd learn something about the different places along the way, which um, I don't think I'm learning cultural things, but I'm enjoying getting into the steampunk world. There's a lot more steampunk than I was expecting, and I'm enjoying getting into the the storytelling aspects of that journey. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, very interesting so far. Um, uh, there are some things in here where I'd be really curious to now read Jules Verne's story around the world in 80 days and seeing where there's correlations between the two. I also kind of want to look up my history of 1872 and discover everything that was happening at the time to see if there are correlations with what's happening in this story from that one. And I know in reading on the Inco blog that um, they wanted a storyteller who would dive into the research of the period as well so part of me is kind of wondering you know okay is there little bits and pieces I mean I know there's tons of fantastical in there but are there bits of, of reality in there um, and I kind of love to kind of explore that